My name is Richardson, and I happen to have been born in Britain. All peoples have their peculiarities and their enthusiasms. We are no exception. One of our enthusiasms is a game whose cause is served by experts and by those who only stand and wait. And while they wait, certain preparations, solemnly proceeding during many hours, reach their climax. For this is Lord's, deeply rooted in tradition and in the ritual tradition brings, where until the proper time, no man may enter unless he have some special access. Well, on this occasion, I have some special access. My name's Arlott, John Arlott, and later on I'll be telling you something about the match. In the meantime, out comes the old country land measure. 22 yards, four rods, poles or perches, one chain, the length of a cricket pitch. They're measuring out the wicket, and that is something of a ritual, as a matter of fact. It takes many hours of skillful work over many months to prepare a first-class wicket, and that's just what this is, the special test wicket. A very revered patch of English turf, plumb in line with the pavilion door. The test wicket of all test wickets, when at Lords, England plays Australia. And when that happens, everything has to be just so, to start with anyway. And while they've been working, the crowds have been gathering. Soon to grow to something like 30,000 people. To say nothing of those who have to stay at home and listen on the radio to people like me. 30,000 people and many millions throughout the world did but time and geography allow. This game called cricket had its origin in quiet places and lives on in equally quiet places, deep in the hearts of those who love it. What is it about this unobtrusive game? What is its magic? For magic it must surely be that makes men sit and watch and dream of past occasions and of wistful yearnings never quite fulfilled. Magic it is that makes the hush when captains meet. The wicket is inspected and another test begins. Don Bradman wins the toss for Australia and Australia are going to bat. They're going to get the first use of this good wicket. And here's the England side coming into the field. Yardley leading them and here's Tom Dollery, Jim Laker, Dennis Compton and Douglas Wright of Kent at the end. And then, out of the pavilion gate, come Australia's opening pair, Barnes and Morris, Morris in the cap. And Alec Bedser of Surrey begins the bowling from the nursery end. Fast medium right arm comes in, bowls to Barnes outside the off stump, and it bounces off Evans' pads. Bedser again, bowls again to Barnes, and again beats him outside the off stump, and the first over is a quiet one, a maiden. And Alec Coxon of Yorkshire bowls the second over from the pavilion end. Elbows well out, comes in, bowls to Morris. Morris forces him away on the onside, and the Australian innings is underway. The first runs up on the board. And so another historic test is underway. Watched by the press of half the world. Watched, too, by appraising eyes in the pavilion. Eyes that have seen many a cricketer come and go. For here in the long room at Lord's, criticism is restrained, praise is brief, and only sunny days and history are long. Here are pictures that have captured in eternal attitudes the beginnings of the game, showing the essence of this thing called cricket, all thought and spirit concentrated on a square of green, a subtle battle between a slice of willow and a round of leather. Days of two stump wickets, when bats were curved and the scorer kept the tally with notches on a stick. Paintings of village greens in days when cockfighting was rife. Pictures of the high noon of Victorian peace, when cricket had become part of English education. And Lords itself in 1837. Then and today, the acknowledged home of cricket. Australia's innings has come to a close. The score stands high and is duly noted. There is time to breathe until England takes the field. Now, cricket in the hands of the experts, more than a game. It's a craft at least, almost a science. 
Let's ask an expert, Bert Rhodes of Derbyshire, to bowl us a leg break on this demonstration wicket. Now, there's the spinning finger, the third one, see, cuddled close against the seam. It comes up. Now, this is the perfect leg break. Watch where it pitches. Just outside the line of the leg stump, and it turns enough to beat the off stump. And now, the orthodox, the natural break, spun off that index finger, the off break. And this pitches, watch it, outside the line of the off stump, and it beats the leg stump. Now, that's the right arm bowler's orthodox weapon. Let's see how the batsman copes with it. As the ball comes down to him, turning into him, well, all right, he just lets it hit the bat. And that's why short leg fieldsmen were born. Well, perhaps attack's the best method of defence. Down comes that off break again, and the batsman hooks it hard and high over those short leg fieldsmen, but not over deep square leg. There is a way of doing it, of course, over the ball as it moves into you, and push it away along the ground as Edrich does this ball from Lindwall, playing it to Barnes. When England earned 27 for one, which is nothing for Englishmen to be very happy about, and Ray Lindwall is bowling at full speed to Hutton. That ball's well up term and he pushes it away past mid-off for a comfortable two. Bradman moves round those hungry Australian slip fieldsmen, and Lindwall, in one of the finest spells of fast bowling seen in England since Larwood, bowls again. This time to Edrich, and Edrich pushes him away out into the covers, quite safely. While experts battle, experts forge the weapons that they use. Good white willow with a wholesome heart, long seasoned like the men who shape it. Skilled hands practicing a long established craft. For wasn't John Small, the cobbler, making cricket balls at Hambledon 200 years ago? Since then, the craft has grown. And yet, there still remains the steadiness of eye and hand that sews the seams. Seams that in the bowler's hands will give the hidden feel for breaks and twists. Seams to withstand the onslaught of the bat. For the heart of a bat is firm, and its blows have strength and punch. Yes, it's got punch, all right. Power. And it doesn't get there by accident. Take the handle now, with its cane and rubber springing, to whip as it's got to when a Hutton or a Bradman drives a fast bowler far away. There's got to be good splicing for that kind of thing, too, but cricket and craftsmanship go hand in hand, and when handle meets blade in a cricket bat, you've got a real piece of craftsmanship. It's the same with the ball, sewn firm and tight, and when it's done, a durable, balanced projectile, carefully weighed and measured and graded, as precise in its making as the hands that will use it, as precise, as precise as a cricket bat. First-class weapons, one designed to break or swing and beat the bat, and the other to fathom the tricks of the bowler and send the ball far away. And it takes Doug Wright at number 11 with a wild swing over the bowler's head, sky high up there into the long field to save England from the follow-on. And Ray Lindwell, with four wickets already in the match, bowls again from the pavilion end and bowls Alec Bedsack. And England are all out for 215, 135 behind Australia on the first innings. There'll be some long faces in the printing room at this news. There's quite an organisation down there. They keep abreast with the play, recording the fall of each wicket and the scores, so that late arrivals can pick up the score in detail straight away as they come in. With Australia 135 in front, they'll probably think that's a pretty sad three pennyworth. But now Australia have started their second innings. Bed, sir, bowls to Barnes, it's in swinger, and Barnes puts it away down to long leg. Round comes Hutton, feeling at long leg, and there's that quick low throw to Godfrey Evans. And now right bowls to Morris, and he's out! When a wicket falls or a hit is made, those behind the scenes spring into action. What they record will go speeding over land and ocean. When a batsman strikes, 
The whole world outside will want to know the score. And when they know it, they'll cast an envious thought to those who sat at Lords and Watch. And there goes Barnes, magnificently caught by Washbrook at Long On for 141. And Australia are now 431 in front. And now here comes Lindsay Hassett, the vice captain, to face up to Norman Yardley. I suppose waiting for the earlier batsman, he's had his pads on for the best part of four hours. Well, he, he can keep them on any longer. Meanwhile, the Don bats on. Don Bradman, on his last test tour and playing his last test innings at Lord's. Don Bradman, the pride of Australia and the despair of England. But whichever side one favours, who can but acclaim a master? Bradman, whose name now joins the golden pageant. And it is a golden pageant. Let's look at just a few of them. Silver Billy Beldam of Hambledon, who in the 1780s became the first great batsman. William Lillywhite, the non-pareil, the man who changed bowling from underarm to roundarm. William Clark, the one-eyed Nottingham bricklayer, who with his All England eleven spread the gospel of cricket all through the country. The Lion of Kent, Alfred Min, the great fast bowler of the 1840s and 50s. Spofforth, the demon bowler from Australia, who in the great test of 1882 even took the wicket of the old man. W.G. Grace, the Gloucestershire country doctor who turned a rustic sport into the science of modern cricket. The first man to score a century before lunch in a test, Victor Trumper. Ranji, and the bowler who suspended the laws of timing, Morris Tate. Clary Grimmett, the most accurate of all leg break bowlers. A problem even for England's great opening pair, Jack Hobbs of Surrey and his imperturbable Yorkshire partner, Herbert Sutcliffe. Jack Hobbs, the modern master, who, in the 1930s, resigned his supremacy to a young man from Bowerall, Donald George Bradman a pageant of 170 years of cricketers on whom the sun always shines. In retrospect, anyway. But cricket casts its own peculiar glow. And in the years to come, this day too of rain and cloud will be sunlit in the memory. Will rain stop play? Anxious eyes survey the wicket. Willing hands turn too. But fate is kind and the battle is renewed. All through a cloudy afternoon they struggle on. The English batsman extra careful, heavily conscious of each wicket as it falls. England won 596 to win and Hutton's out. Out for 13 and England 42 for one wicket. And now Toshak bowls to Edridge. Ian Johnson catches him at first slip. Edridge is out. England 52 for two wickets, and in trouble. That'll hurry them and depress them in the printing room. Well, with two wickets gone for 52, England are in a lot of trouble. Indeed, almost everything depends on the man who now comes out of the pavilion. Dennis Compton. And with Hutton gone, England's last real hope. So they fight on, a battle of muscle, sinew, and eye. For this is cricket at its finest, calling forth a quality deep in men, the calmness of a Compton on a sticky wicket when the world is watching, steadiness of nerve and quick agility. To be a Hobbs, a Sutcliffe, a Bradman or a Compton, the heroes change with the years but the dream to be a cricketer lives on in every generation. And the heroes pass on their knowledge for cricket is a part of the very substance of a country's education. But the game knows no class and indeed no frontier. In the West Indies, Australia, New Zealand, India, under the shadow of Table Mountain, developing the same qualities in men regardless of background, color or creed. 
England, 106 for three, want an impossible 490 to win. Impossible? Well, Thompson's still there. And here's Big Bill Johnson with that bucking, bridling run coming into bowl to him. And Compton's out. England's last hope of the impossible. And now, Toshak bowls to Cox, and Toshak thinks he's out. Umpire thinks he's out. Cox thinks it's a shame. Now it's all over, bar shouting. The day wears on. Another game is lost and won. Well, perhaps not quite. Defeat has come to England, and to Australia, victory. Australia takes the ashes. But victory is the least that men play cricket for. They play it for a host of reasons, ill-defined and hard to seek. On school ground, on city street, on village green, they play on. For the urge wells deep from quiet places, in men and in the land they spring from. Thank you.